It's such a pleasure to have our distinguished speakers and audience here with us. We have uh, stakeholders from different local and global organizations in our audience. And I would like to welcome all of you to this great discussion on an important topic at this point in time. And that is the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence. Uh, let me introduce myself for those who do not know me. My name is Jan Johannes and I'm the chair for the Center for Gender Equity at UJHG, which is hosting this event ahead of uh, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The Center for uh, Gender uh, Equity was established at the end of 2019 with the purpose of mainstreaming gender and diversity across UJHG's operations, including our academic practices and courses, our organizational practices, our research and advocacy work. We, of course, uh, focus on education at different uh, levels, including development of masters in gender and reproductive health, short uh, courses and programs on gender and global um, health related matters. So beyond uh, mainstreaming gender at uh, UJC, we also aim to assist other institutions to do so by providing technical support. So uh, it is a great pleasure to host this event and we look forward to the discussions. And now I would like to introduce our speakers and chair to the podium. Today uh, here with us, we have seven distinguished speakers and the panel will be chaired by UJT's Vice Chancellor, Professor Agnes Pinaguaho. Professor Agnes Pinaguaho is the Vice Chancellor of the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda. She previously worked as the Executive Secretary of Rwanda's National AIDS Control Commission as permanent secretary of the Ministry of Health and as the Minister of Health. She serves as a senior advisor to the Director General of the WHO, is senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School and adjunct clin clinical professor at Dartmouth. She is a member of the US National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the African Academy of Sciences. She has published over 200 peer reviewed articles and was named among the 100 most influential African women of 2020. Thank you for chairing this panel, Professor Agnes. Thank you. Let me introduce our next speakers next. Our first speaker is Rose Ra Rabuhihi. Ms. Rose Rabuhihi currently serves as the head of the Gender Monitoring Office, a government institution entrusted to contribute to ensure accountability of public, private institutions in implementing gender equality in Rwanda. In addition, Ms. Rose has worked for more than 15 years with the UN in several countries in Africa and the United States of America. She has extensive work experience with research institutions and NGOs. The main focus of her work has been to promote gender equality and women's rights in development with specific focus on governance, peace and security and violence against women. Welcome to this panel, Ms. Rose. Our second speaker will be Ilian Howey who's a lawyer and a specialist in gender and family violence. Ilian Howey has a bachelor's degree in law from University of Lima, a master's degree in public management and a, ma a magister's, magister's degree in constitutional law from the National University Federico Viralial. She is a teacher and researcher, gender violence specialist, author of several books such as Gender Violence, Sexual Harassment and Femicide, Family Jurisprudence Manual. She worked for eight years in the Ministry of Women's Affairs and Vulnerable Populations as General Di Director Against Gender Violence and Executive Director of the National Program Against Violence and Family and Sexual Violence. She has dedicated her labor to the, prote the protection of children and women against gender violence, and she strives for the economic and political empowerment of women as a key factor in sustainable development. I'd like to welcome um, you to this important discussion, Ilian. Our next speaker will be Jean Flora Kaitesi, who's currently a senior program officer within the Gender Directorate at the African Union Commission's Women, Gender and Di Development Directorate. Her principal responsibility is to ensure outreach and interaction on gender issues with African Union member states, regional economic communities, or RECs, AU organs, private sectors, and civil society organizations. Jan Flora KTC has multidisciplinary educational background. In addition to a master's degree in public law and political science, she holds a master's degree in peace and security. Prior to joining AUC, 
Jamflora has occupied senior positions in different international, regional, and local organizations dealing with the promotion and protection of women's rights, children's rights, and human rights in general, and has amassed a re remarkable mix of experience for more than 25 years. Ms. Um, Jamflora is a Rwandan. Thank you uh, for being here with us, Ms. Jan. Another speaker uh, in this panel is Dr. Eugene Richardson, who is Assistant Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Richardson previously served as the clinical lead for Partners in Health, Ebola Response in Kono District, Sierra Leone, where he continues to conduct research on the social epidemiology of Ebola virus disease. He also worked as a clinical case management consultant for the WHO's Ebola response in Beni, Democratic Republic of the Congo. More recently, he was seconded to Africa CDC to join their COVID-19 response. His overall focus is on biosocial approach to epidemic disease prevention, containment, and treatment in Sub-Saharan Africa. As part of this effort, he's the chair of the Lancet Commission on Repartition and Redistribution redistributive justice. Welcome to this panel, Dr. Ejin, and thank you for joining us today. Our next speaker is uh, Che Brown from Alice Springs in Australia. Australia. Che is a research and program coordinator at the Equity, Equality Institute and a postdoctoral fellow fellow with the Center for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at the Australian U National University. She has been researching violence against women for 10 years and has lived experience of domestic, family, and sexual violence. Her PhD research focused on what works to prevent violence against women. She has laid safety mapping exercises with women in town camps in Alice Springs and laid the development of the Northern Territory specific violence prevention framework, namely Hopeful Together Strong. Thank you for being with us to get today, uh, Jay. The next speaker I will introduce is Dr. Prabha Chandra. Dr. Prabha Chandra is a professor and previous head of psychiatry at the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences in Bangalore, India. She has served as a temporary advisor to the, to the World Health Organization and UNAIDS and is president-elect of the International Association of Women's Mental Health. She has been an investigator in several research projects related to women's mental health and is a co-author of the, the World Psychiatric Association Curriculum on Intimate Partner and Sexual Violence. Professor Chandra, as a renowned global expert on women's mental health, will share insights gained from her research and clinical practice during the pandemic to reflect on the impact of the pandemic on mental health of women and girls experiencing violence and abuse in low and middle income countries. And thank you for the perspective you'll bring into this uh, session, Dr. Prava. Last but not least, we have a speaker from Niger, Diana Ofona. Diana Ofona is the resident res representative of UNDP in Niger since April 2019. As the main interlocutor with the government of Niger on behalf of UNDP, her key assignment is to provide substantive leadership for sustainable and inclusive development with particular focus on AU Agenda 2063 and UN Agenda 2030. She is also responsible for formulating the overall UNDP country, country strategy for Niger, for mobilizing resources and partnerships for Niger's development agenda, for providing strategy guidance and oversight for UNDP's operations in Niger. A leader and senior international development practitioner, she has demonstrated capacity to shape and lead transformative socioeconomic policy, often described as an influencer, prolific speaker and coach. Ms. Ofona has served on several high-level board and committees, notably the UN High-Level Strategy and Management Review Panel, commissioned to develop a new strategy for UNDP in Africa. And thank you for being here with us uh, today, Ms. Ofona. Again, I would like to say uh, that it is such a pleasure to, uh, for the Center for Gender uh, Equity at University of Global Health Equity to host this uh, important panel. And now I would like to call on the chair of this panel, Professor Agnes Binaguaho, to take us through the next sessions. Welcome to the podium, Professor Agnes.
Thank you very much, Sion, for the wonderful introductions. I am delighted to welcome everyone to this event. First, I want to thank the expert panelists and our participants for joining us today from all over the world. As Sion told you, our webinar today will feature different experts who will be discussing the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence. And it is hosted by our very dynamic Center of Gender Equity at the University of Global Health Equity. This webinar is organized by, in solidarity and by solidarity with the United Nations Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women that it's observed during this month of November. Gender-based violence is a human right violation widely spread worldwide. Violence against women takes so many forms, such as intimate partner violence, female genital mutilation, child marriage, where today more than 700, uh, 750 million women and girls were married before they turned 18 years old. The impact of gender-based violence uh, range from immediate and long-term physical, mental, emotional, and sexual consequences, and even death in the most extreme circumstances. The issue of gender-based violence is very alarming, and we need to continue to come together across the world to raise awareness and take actions. As we know, the COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated all social injustice, all, faced by minorities, and also the violence against girls and women. Due to the pandemic enforced prevention measures, such as lockdown, quarantine, and isolation, have restricted women and girls to stay home, and this has resulted in an increased exposure of abu to abusers, at home and also teenage pregnancies. Moreover, COVID-19 pandemic has had an economic toll on many women who have to take care of their families, resulting in an increased financial and food insecurity in many families with an increased stress and, bur uh, and burden on families, poor families, especially their women. When we take a look at the gender demographic in the health sector, we found that uh, women hold the majority of frontline healthcare delivery jobs, such as nurses and community health workers, meaning that they are more likely to be exposed the to the virus while protecting their community and all of us worldwide from COVID-19. This also means that during this pandemic, many women have to leave their home to isolate themselves from their children and their family in order to protect the beloved, their beloved ones. However, we cannot forget also that gender-based violence disproportionately affects the vulnerable and the poor. In this webinar, we are going to explore all those aspects of gender-based violence. And uh, we are going to learn from our fantastic and great panelists that are really global leaders and they will share with us global to local perspective and discuss how together we can work to strengthen the leadership and advocacy for eliminating gender-based violence during this pandemic and beyond. So welcome again to all of you and thank you again for joining us today. Before we dive to, to, into the discussion, let me begin by asking each of our panelists to give their introduction re, uh, remarks Remember also that this webinar is part of a series of webinars linked to the platform Ask Professor Agnes. It's a global debate. It's a global debate. And uh, this uh, uh, global debate uh, is on Twitter. It is on uh, Facebook. It is on um, uh, Instagram. So, all the questions that will be asked during the web webinar and that will not be answered because we lack time will be answered through this platform, Ask Professor Agnes. And uh, the expert that you have here in front of you will help me to ask 
to answer those questions. So join me now to welcome Rose Rabuhihi. Rose will share with us today the economic impact of gender-based violence. Rose, the floor is yours. Just put on the slide of Rose, please. Yes. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Agnes, for uh, inviting us. And I'm very happy to see uh, some old friends that I had lost for a long time. Hi, Diana. Hi, uh, participants. Hello. Um, you know, uh, it is a fact uh, that the global economy has been uh, disrupted uh, by uh, uh, COVID-19 and that it has uh, increased poverty, but also it has increased conflict in homes. However, uh, we should not forget that the big gender gap that was already that gender big gap was already there. This is not new, it has been exacerbated. In fact, the crisis has just worsened what was already in our world globally and in many other countries. If you look, for example, so I have, okay, next, go to the next slide. Yeah, so, uh, I was saying that we had already big imbalances in terms of uh, gender in the uh, economy and the crisis, the COVID-19 crisis is just coming to worsen what was already there. For example, if you look at a few indicators, you'll see that it was not that good in, on many fronts. For example, if you look on the indicator of unpaid care work, you'll see that, for example, in Rwanda, we had women working 21 hours and paid domestic care work. And globally, you see, for example, that 60% of uh, men are in the former sector, while women make up uh, 51 in the, uh, in this, on the same, uh, in the informal sector. And that in Africa, the informal sector employs 89 uh, and more percent of women. All of this is showing that there was already a big economic gap that should have been addressed and has to be still addressed. And that is going to put women much more in poverty and also bringing some conflict at, at, um, at, at home. Uh, next slide. Uh, coming uh, back home, coming back uh, to Rwanda, although we have still uh, growing gaps uh, between men and women and the economic front, we had started really to improve. And uh, we have seen through different data that, for example, the financial inclusion had improved, that access to mobile phone had improved, that the possession of land and other assets had also improved. But then came COVID and the NICR, the Institute of Statistics that was published in May 22 and May 2020, indicates that employment rate for both female and male rose to 25% for, uh, for female and 19.6 for male. This because of the outbreak of uh, COVID. And again, this is going to have a huge impact in having already a huge impact in conflict in the families because they are sharing very scarce resources. And you know, when we have, a, we have limited resources, conflicts are at the door knocking. And many times women are those who, who suffer more. Now coming to gender-based violence, again, uh, we see that there was already a bad trend globally. 35% of women worldwide having experienced physical abuse by their own intimate. This is something that is very scary. 
And this is something that might be uh, worsening because of the economic situation and the privacy of the sources in homes. This is something that we should really watch out because, uh, can you go to the next slide? So I was saying that the situation of gender-based violence is something that was already there before COVID. Like the gap and the difference between economic gap between men and women was already there. But the few countries that were trying to come out of it, like that was happening in Rwanda, the statistic uh, we showed in the previous slide showed it, but those are going now to be, uh, to be impacted in the negative way. And now coming back to gender-based violence, 35%, the third of women in this world were suffering already from gender-based violence. And the situation of poverty, the situation of economic crisis is going to impact much more. And this is something that worldwide we should watch. We should really put our attention on it and resources to ensure that is not going to be another crisis, another crisis in another crisis. And this is going to impact again the economy because when women are, no, are suffering from gender-based violence, when they can't access resources, when they, they can't go to the market, when they can't possess, again, it brings more poverty at home. So there is a big correlation between the economy and GBV, and this is something that is very well known, documented, that what is lacking is really uh, intentional measures to stop it and to improve the situation. Now, uh, the correlation uh, I am talking about is very clear, for example, in Rwanda, when we see where the, the, the gender responsive policies and, uh, and measures were enacted, we could see how female, how women, how girls and how the households were improving at the economic side. For example, now traditions in, in Rwanda, the land is the big asset and for some it is the only asset. And for a long time, women have been kept out of that resource. They couldn't own land, but there was a land reform. There was change in policies and very important progressive programs were put in place. And we could see very, in a very short time, how this impacted on the economy of women. For example, when women were uh, allowed to possess and to have land, we have seen how the financial inclusion has really improved. But now, because of the, the, the poverty, then we are seeing now many conflicts about the land. When, for example, the, the, the husband is trying to sell it without the, the, the authorization of the wife, and the conflict are arising because this poverty is pushing some of the people to sell land, to sell assets, and then the conflict in the home are again rising. And this is going to again put the family in poverty and vice versa, there is a very uh, visible correlation. I'm trying to go very quickly, um, and go to the next slide. No, the, the previous one. Yeah, so now there is something that we have to watch out. I'm again giving the, giving the experience uh, of Rwanda. For example, in Rwanda, 20% of women can decide, this is the DHS uh, data, show that 20% only, 20, I, I said only, 20% of women can decide on their own earnings. This is already a violence in economic violence. Why should someone can't even decide on his own earnings? This is something that is going again to, to be a main and a very uh, important cause of, of conflict because when you can't decide on what you have and decide on what you are going to use for, 
this again is something that is going to impact on the family and the individuals. And some programs have tried and are being enacted to really ensure that there is more decision making by women and men on their own resources or what the resources they are sharing with the family. But you know, the, the social norms are go, the change in some are going very slowly. And the COVID is going to impact very much on the decision of women where they can really uh, decide what to do and what how to use what they are earning. Again, the employment that is that is increasing both for men and women is going to put again much more at risk the families and be again another cause of conflict because of scarce of resources. So there is a very, uh, very clear uh, co correlation between the family, the economic insecurity or the chronic poverty. It makes individual in the household themselves more likely to experience acute stress and the sort of risky coping strategies that are going to increase the risk of gender-based uh, violence. Um, I'd like to conclude with a last slide. I'd like to conclude putting forward uh, recommendations. Uh, one is on a paid care economy. It is very important that we really work on this, document it, but also find measures to ensure that the unpaid care work is addressed. For example, we think we should really push the private sector to produce affordable technologies. We need innovation from the youth to ensure that we can help rural areas, women, the homes, to reduce this unpaid care economy. I used to say to my colleagues, we can fight for a long time trying to bring men to share to the, for the division of labor. It will take time, but it will take less time if we push on the technology side in the issue that the unpaid care economy is reduced. We have to ensure that GBV is prevented. We have a lot of measures in Rwanda. I think I have time to talk about, about them. Reducing GBV is going to improve the economy of the families. It's going to improve the health of the women. It is going to improve how, how, how children are able to go to school, how children can uh, have better food on the table. It is very critical that gender-based violence is prevented. And this is something that we can all come together. I thank you so much. Uh, you're on mute, Professor Atmos. Sorry, am I, you hear me now? Do yes. you hear me? Okay. Yeah. So I want to thank you, Rose, for the, this insightful presentation explaining how COVID-19 crisis has made uh, has worsened the economic gap. Uh, and it, it's right, because a recent study has predicted that 70 million more people will fall un, in poverty uh, before the end of the first summit, semester, uh, trimester nine, uh, 2021. It's enormous. And we can see that among them, women will be the majority. You have also shared uh, how this crisis roll back the gain women have made in the legal framework and how technology can help us. Thank you. Our second panelist is Ilian Awi uh, from Peru. She will share with us her experience from Peru. Uh, she's going to talk about the st status of gender-based violence in the context of COVID-19 prevention, risk and mitigation and the response given in Peru. Join me to welcome Ilian. Thank you very much, Agnes. I am grateful to be here uh, for asking me to, me to participate in this important event 
that allow us to share common next solutions to combat gender based in violence. Violence against women, especially that carried out their partner and sexual violence, constitutes a serious public health problem and a violation of human rights. It's a social problem, an enormous problem with big repercussions that uh, join us from different cultures or different conditions or different levels, education, religion, race, ethnicity, and age. It's a product of our structure, organizations of power in historical unequal relations between women and men who respond to deeply ingrained social and cultural patterns in society that conceal deep gender discrimination. Latin America is a proof of that. In particular, in my country, uh, domestic violence and sexual uh, abuse have increased in a result of a spread of COVID-19. In this regards, our Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, urged states to make measures to confront shocking global ups weakening in domestic violence. The Peruvian state and the institutions that make up the justice system have made considered efforts to allocate resources and budgets for this purpose. However, they did not evaluate the different impact in the pandemic on women from a gender perspective. As you see in the, la in the, in the map, uh, Latin America is on average one of three women that suffer physical or sexual violence in an intimate relationship through her life. And one of the main strategies to control perpetrators of domestic violence is to isolate the victim. So the map, has as a result that every two hours a woman is murdered in Latin America for the mere fact of being a woman, and this is increasing. Unfortunately, uh, during the quarantine in Peru, we had to combat the increase in intimate feminicides and sexual violence against girls and teenagers, plus 40,000 emergency calls asking for help and counseling or reporting gender-based violence in addition to the disappearance of almost 1,000 women that we are still looking for. Next, please. Uh, I would like to show what has been the unequal impact of COVID-19 on men and women for us in is a double pandemic. We have to fight to combat gender bias, uh, gender-based violence plus COVID-19, in addition to this quarantine, uh, caused female unemployment, particularly in the tourism, in the retail, and domestic workers that domestic workers were 100% unemployed. Nobody wants to work with people that don't, uh, you know, been able to, to go back and forward to their houses because they are afraid about COVID-19. So most of them lost their services. Over here in Peru, it's like 2 million of people dedicated to domestic work. Also, uh, the employment is very informal in Peru. So from uh, like 64 female, uh, I employ from that 75 uh, female that are women that are employed in informal uh, jobs. So their pay are very poor. Hmm? They were left unprotected and without income, living at, with abuse partners and isolated. Women were very seriously impacted with the health crisis. They has evidenced the informality and precarious, precariousness of their income, in addition to the existing gap between the wages of men and women. Another example of an even impact of COVID-19 was in health sector due to the fact that seven of 10 health sector workers are women, that coincidence with the feminization of healthcare tasks in Peru, we obey to the care role traditionally assigned to women who have been the first front of care until today. They have to take care of her patients, her family and themselves, having to work long hours inside and outside the home that depress their immune system and double expose them to contagion. In addition to this domestic work, women have to deal with telecommuting and children with school at home, plus buy food and cook. As for the work of the kitchen that is attributed to women due to gender stereotypes, when she goes 
to get food, she has been more exposed to the virus. That's the, one of the main reasons that our health department have detected is the main uh, situation for contagion in the case of women. Consequently, the gap in the use of time between men and women dedicated to domestic work and paid work is about nine hours and 15 minutes more of domestic work performed by women versus the work performed by men. And also, if we took the 95 uh, hours that the, normally the women work by the week, most of these 95 hours are uh, engaged in domestic work and they are not paid. It, if we compare with the men that work, you know, more than 100 hours by week, uh, there are more, more than the half of these 100 hours are being well paid, more than for women, and they don't dedicate too much time to domestic work that uh, limits the possibility of the woman to come out of poverty. Next, please. In the situation of the prevention to prevent gender-based violence and continue providing care and protection services to women and their families, special laws were passed that allowed the judiciary to attend through virtual channels to provide protection measures in 24 hours. And in the same way, the police execute them. Additional, the judges were authorized to hold virtual hearings to issue precautionary measures for child custody and separations of property in the event of domestic violence. This one is our best practices we have to share with you. Uh, this, uh, the use of ticks in the judiciary procedure allowed us to uh, somehow uh, stop the feminicide in the, the, some regions of the, our country that were very violent. Next, please. In response to the increase in violence against women and femicide, the Women Ministry reinforces and care services through our line, telephone line 100 and chat 100. Itinerary emergency service were provided and sent informative message to 22 million mobile phones. You are not alone. Our campaign, you see the purple, the purple figure. And this one is our most, uh, one of our good practices because when the people receive the, directly the message in their mobile phones, they start to call a lot. Our, uh, the, the number of calls we received like, was like five times that we have before. So we're a lot of, of calls to ask. That was a challenge for us. And also our women emergency centers provide for all our victims, legal advice, psychological advice, social care, and temporary shelter home is they, is they ask for. But most of the time was the aggressor who was re, uh, retired out of the home, not the, the woman was the man. Despite this, we cannot deny that there was a being a fracture in the provision of uh, police services to the high demand they have because they are, you know, concerned about the health situation, the health crisis, and they're not always go uh, attend the calls of help uh, that the women are making. So, finally, the government response was the delivery of bonus or bonds to families and especially the economic reactivation of small businesses. Next, please. And the budget was increased for results-oriented budget program for the reduction of violence against women, resources that are destined to, the, to all the state institutions that intervene in the root of care for victims or violence. And also I want to, I want to, to say that in Peru, a half of our 33 millions of people, of habitants, of citizens in Peru are women. So if we are half of the population, we also want to be half of the decision of what is going to be the next policy, public policies that the, uh, the government, the new government that starts yesterday, we start with a new president, Mr. Sagastiki, and he is um, you know, calling women to, to go with him in his cabinet minister. And we are very pleased that our premier is a woman, 
and we are now have the chance to uh, uh, put some uh, teams that are very important for us, the women agenda in the political and public uh, services that we mostly need to go on with this double pandemic. Uh, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. I remain at your disposal for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ilian. Uh, for sharing with us your perspective on gender-based violence in Peru. You have shown us that, uh, unfortunately, the extreme gender-based violence leading to death of women is more common than we are ready to acknowledge. And you have also shared the best practice of virtual judiciary and security protection of women. That's great, uh, to it. and also, um, having woman, wo more women in uh, decision making can certainly help fighting uh, the vulnerability of women in a society. We will now hearing uh, uh, from uh, Dr. Eugen uh, Richardson. Uh, Jean, uh, we know uh, that women health workers are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Please share with us uh, the lessons uh, you have uh, extracted from your experience in Sierra Leone uh, with Ebola, and now uh, what happened with uh, COVID-19 among health professionals. The floor is yours, Jean. Okay, thanks so much to Dr. Agnes, my dear friend and mentor for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this distinguished panel. Um, and today, yes, I will speak briefly on uh, lessons from the impact of uh, Ebola and COVID on uh, GBV and gender disparities. Next slide, please. So before I continue, I would like to recognize our amazing students at the University of Global Health Equity. This is the first year class last year uh, who we taught social medicine to. Um, and it is my favorite time of year to be with them. Unfortunately, this year we had to teach virtually, but I'm looking forward to joining the next class as soon as possible. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So during the West Africa Ebola outbreak, quarantines and school closures made women and adolescent girls more vulnerable to coercion, exploitation, and sexual abuse. Um, notably, pregnancy increased by 65% during the period, uh, mainly on account of uh, school closures. Uh, restrictions on movement also hindered attendance at community meetings where education was given about how individuals could protect themselves and their families from contracting the disease. So here, here you have an example of gender norms, you know, not allowing uh, the women to, to go out to some of these meetings, really affecting outbreak dynamics, um, since women are usually the ones that are um, in charge of you know, protecting the children and, and designing um, you know, infection prevention and control at home. And so um, you know, it's, it's an example of how gender norms can not only uh, result in direct uh, you know, gender-based violence, but indirect violence through increased um, uh, cases and mortality during outbreaks because uh, women are left with uh, without the ability to protect themselves. Um, next slide, please. And this was notably pronounced in the DRC Ebola outbreak, where around 60% of cases were women. Um, and that is because, you know, their uh, women do most of the caretaking for the sick and also um, take care of bodies for funerals. But there was also an increase in sexual violence and domestic violence. And this was due to canceled school uh, economic security. But interestingly and importantly, um, because women were setting up the infection prevention and control IPC for their households, they were taking increased trips to fe fetch water. And it was during these increased trips outside the home that they were uh, prey and, and, and vul vulnerable to uh, sexual violence. I was reminded of um, in South Africa in some of the townships, they've shown that the farther women live from the toilet facilities, 
the more likely they are to experience sexual violence just because they have, they have to walk further outside the home. So that a structural intervention in domestic or in sexual uh, violence in South Africa was to put more toilets in the townships. So, I mean, think about that, how, uh, uh, you know, structurally determined uh, gender-based violence can be. Uh, another problem is that uh, the inequality has increased post -ep epidemic because girls are less likely to return to school uh, once classrooms open again. Notably, there was uh, increased sexual exploitation, including accusations against WHO and NGOs, which I'm sure many of you saw in the media. Um, and one of the problems that exacerbated is that most women said that they were unaware of how to re report this abuse or exploitation. So it's not only local norms that need to be um, uh, challenged, it's, it's the humanitarian world and the uh, uh, UN agencies that, that have uh, norms that need to be challenged as well. Uh, next slide, please. So for COVID-19, globally around 70% of the health sector workers are women, which puts them at, at higher risk of infection. Lockdowns have exacerbated tensions in the home, leading to increased levels of gender-based violence, while restrictions on movement are creating barriers for women seeking to escape abuse and access services. Um, female professionals, especially those with children, are paying a <laughs> steep career price in the pandemic, uh, and the infrastructure to support these women is abysmal in most countries. And I'll speak a little bit uh, uh, more on this in the Q&A, where we have a prepared question that deals with this. Um, next slide, please. And I put this up uh, to uh, talk about a quick theory. Uh, and there is, there is a theory that um, it's, it's called the inoculum effect in microbiology, that if you receive just a little bit of COVID or SARS-CoV-2 virus, that you're more likely to, to have a mild illness than, than if you than if you take in a big dose. Uh, so therefore it follows that people that wear masks uh, are more would be more likely to have a more mild illness because their mask is helping trap some of the virus and they'll be exposed to a, a smaller inoculum. Now it's been shown that women significantly uh, um, wear masks more frequently than men. So this shows that uh, if, if that theory is true that women are contributing less to using healthcare resources because those that wear masks and, and catch it that way are having milder illnesses. But it also shows that they're doing better work of prevention because they're more likely to follow uh, the COVID nor the rules and the wearing of masks. And really all it what to me this shows, it's obvious that women should be leading the COVID response in all countries and unfortunately they are not. Uh, next slide, please. I think that's it. Okay, so um, there'll be we can discuss some more in the Q and A. But uh, I thank you for your attention and, and look forward to discussion later. Thank you, uh, Jane, for highlighting the lesson uh, coming from West Africa, uh, DRC on Ebola, and uh, also on COVID, uh, this uh, inoculum theory and showing us that it's not only in the home that women are at risk, it's also on the way outside the home to do business, the daily business, and the need to challenge the international norms. Uh, yes, and also what you say about women protecting more the world and be better in prevention, we all have to remember that country led by women in general has been done better in their national response for COVID. So yeah, I think we should put more women in leadership position. Our next panelist is Shay Brown joining us from Australia. Shay will, uh, will share with us uh, the intersectionality of belonging to a minority group and gender-based violence in Australia. Shay, the floor is yours. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this um, esteemed panel. Um, I don't have a presentation to share, so you'll, you'll just have to um, put, up, put up with me for a little while, I suppose. 
Um, so I just want to start by acknowledging that I'm on Aranda country. So something that we do in Australia is we, we begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians and the Indigenous people on the lands on which we meet. So I'm on Aranda country. I live in Mbantua, which is in central Australia. And I just want to acknowledge uh, their elders past, present and emerging and extend my acknowledgement to your elders as well on, on all the lands and all the countries that we're Zooming from today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the intersectionality of race and gender and how that influences gender-based violence in Australia. So I'm attempting to offer an Australian case study within the broader landscape of COVID and gender-based violence, which, um, as we've been hearing from the panellists tonight, is, is really quite similar all around the world uh, with a few differing contextual realities. So my work is mainly focused on violence against women, primarily intimate partner violence, family violence and sexual violence. And I work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women who make up the Indigenous people of Australia. So I can't speak on behalf of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women, but I can speak to my own experience as a practitioner, as a survivor, and as a researcher in this space. So my work is focused um, on the Northern Territory of Australia, which is where I'm from. Um, the Northern Territory is around the size of Texas in the USA but with less than 250,000 people. So I believe that's about 0 0.16 um, persons per square kilometre. So very, very sparsely populated. The Northern Territory is considerably less affluent than the rest of Australia. It's extremely remote and does not have the same access to goods and services as the rest of Australia. Much of the Northern Territory does not have phone network co coverage, for example. And many communities are without basic infrastructure, such as appropriate and adequate housing, running water, power, and roads. Rates of violence, particularly violence against women, are extremely high and severe. Aboriginal women in the Northern Territory, for example, are the most victimized group of people um, by domestic and family violence in the entire world. I offer you this context as it speaks to how COVID has impacted violence against women and how these impacts are exacerbated for particular groups. So all around the world during COVID violence against women increased. Here in the Northern Territory, it increased by 25%. And that, that was predicted. And we knew this would come because we know that violence against women goes up in crisis situations. The increase during periods of stress is theorized as being a result of increased tension within relationships as well as the introduction of other risk factors for violence, such as trauma, financial hardship, and alcohol and substance abuse. But there were specific elements about COVID and our response to COVID that also increased the risk of violence against women. And some of the other panelists have already touched on this. The requirement for isolation, government's advice to stay at home, means that women were increasingly socially isolated. And these are right conditions for coercive control. Depriving women from accessing their support networks and putting them in a position where they were alone with their abusers for prolonged periods. There have been reports of men using COVID-19 as justification for isolating their female partners, depriving them of health care and barring them from support services. Also, daily activities that women may have used as a means to report and, and help seek, for example, dropping children at home, visiting the supermarket, visiting a family member all became far more difficult or were barred entirely. It also meant that women were less able to report and seek help due to the proximity to abusers. So the increases that we have seen all around the world, they're really only the tip of the iceberg. Under normal circumstances, we know that violence against women in all of its forms is underreported. So the actual number is likely to be far higher. In some areas, it seems, it seems as though reported violence was falling. And this was because women were less able to report. So in some areas, we saw women shifting to other platforms to seek help. For example, women were making use of WhatsApp. Um, and this opens up a whole other conversation about accessibility and the importance of safe and fair access to technology that I don't have the space to talk about right now, but it is really important to think about in relation to violence against women. Um, during COVID, at the same time, so support services were less able to respond as staff had been sent home were on, or were on reduced hours and were also in lockdown. So we, we really had this trifecta 
we had increased risk factors for violence, we had women less able to report, and we had services less able to respond um, to, to when it, women experience violence. And then when we consider the intersection of race, then the picture becomes increasingly complicated. In response to the COVID-19 crisis, for example, the Northern Territory government recommended and returned Aboriginal people to remote communities as they believe this is where they would be safest. There were huge social media campaigns urging Aboriginal people to re return to community and offering them assistance to do so. The Australian government also repeatedly and decisively advised people to remain in their homes and avoid social interaction. All women are at greater risk of experiencing violence in times of crisis. However, Indigenous women in remote communities are, all, are at heightened risk. Prior to the pandemic, Indigenous women were already disproportionately affected by violence and were overrepresented overrepresented as domestic family and sexual violence victims. Aboriginal women sent back to country had limited access to support networks and to services. The ability to communicate and report are vital to monitor risk and prevent the reoccurrence of violence. However, remote Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory have little access to support and emergency services. And many communities have no phone coverage, they have no police and they have no women's shelter. Domestic family and sexual violence services are also usually based in regional towns. And these services were unable to monitor women experiencing violence or for men using violence um, out on those remote places. Of the specialist services that were operating in communities, most have been grounded in response to social distancing measures and travel restrictions. And much of what I'm talking about is tied to poverty and the underdevelopment of remote indigenous communities. And let me be clear, this is a direct result of ongoing colonization and structural racism. The Northern Territory government also closed the most widely used forms of transport in and out of communities and banned all non-essential travel. This meant remote communities were even more cut off. The roads into and borders around community were patrolled by police, which lowered the police ability to respond to domestic violence. And I don't want to make this presentation all about reporting or all about police response, because we know that that doesn't necessarily keep women safe. And there are dynamics there to consider as well, like police's relationship with indigenous communities and whether police are the right people to respond to domestic family and sexual violence. Nevertheless, it was extremely difficult to identify, access and support women experiencing violence in remote indigenous communities particularly those women who had not previously been identified as being at risk. In addition to Aboriginal women being increasingly vulnerable to COVID, it also highlighted whether our responses to domestic family and sexual violence are culturally appropriate. For example, messaging and awareness programs about COVID and about violence against women, whether these are hygiene related or otherwise, are these accessible to Indigenous people? Are they in a language that they can understand in a format and or on a platform that they can access? Who is responsible for ensuring that Indigenous communities receive a steady and regular flow of accurate information in a form they can understand and make use of? Is government really just pitching to mainstream and to the middle and not considering how these issues intersect to make Aboriginal women more vulnerable to experiencing violence? presents additional barriers to seeking help and marginalises them when pursuing justice. But on that note, I do just want to finish by saying that COVID did illustrate the strength and self-determination of Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, who really took charge in the response to keep their communities safe from COVID. We just need to make sure that violence against women or the shadow pandemic, as it's sometimes being referred to, is not overlooked. Thank you. Thank you, Che, for uh, explaining the highest risk of uh, gender-based violence for women member of a uh, minority group due to structural violence and inaccessibility to services. Uh, to reassure our participant, I just want to say that uh, uh, our um, speakers have so much to say that five minutes was too small. So we are going to extend uh, by 30 minutes uh, this uh, webinar uh, before uh, giving the floor to Professor Prabha Chandra uh, from India. Uh, please join, you, join me to welcome uh, Professor Chandra. 
Hello, um, and, and thanks for having me for this to, at this wonderful, wonderful panel. And I've been learning so much and, and also trying to uh, sort of understand and reflect on how problems seem to be the same anywhere in the world. Um, and solutions and, and the wonderful solutions in Peru, in Australia, in Africa, uh, and how much there is to learn from each other. So um, I work a lot with mothers and babies. And so a lot of my um, mental health work uh, is involved uh, in, in that uh, arena. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what kind of challenges women who were going to have babies, who were pregnant, who had childbirth during this period also faced in addition to all the rest of it. Now in India, um, some strange things happened and I'm gonna illustrate these by some stories because I'm a, I'm a clinician, I'm a psychiatrist, so I see women and their stories. Um, but I want to emphasize how, I mean, you all know that India is right now in the second place just, just after the USA in terms of the prevalence of COVID-19 and, and we really, uh, our population is large, so maybe that's why the numbers are huge, but then still it's a, it's a very, very big challenge that we're facing. Two things happen in India. The first thing, which probably didn't happen as much in many other parts of the world, was stigma. Um, the COVID-related stigma was enormous, and I won't go into what the reasons were. There were all kinds of reasons re related to religious minorities, related to racial tensions. There were a whole range of reasons why stigma became a huge issue very early on in, in COVID. Uh, and I think when there is stigma, there is violence. And so it kind of increased uh, the levels of violence. The second thing that happened, and I think she kind of talked about it, which happened in her community as well, was uh, India has a large migrant population, which means people move from one state to another for employment. Now, when employment stopped because of COVID, uh, these people were not able to go back to their homes and they were stuck. They didn't have jobs and they were stuck and the levels of tension were very high. Transport was not available from one state to another. Borders were shut. There was a lot of policing which went on uh, and they didn't have employment. So you can imagine the kind of tension that this group was facing. So you had stigma and you had um, the inability to go to safe places in homes, to their own communities, to their own villages, uh, which actually increased mental health problems uh, hugely. Now we know that when mental health problems increase, violence also increases. So I'm going to take you through some of these stories. Uh, these stories basically are women who came to me for help. Um, what happened was that as soon as the lockdown was, was called, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare contacted us um, and said, you know, we want to do something uh, for the mental health of people. And they started a, a psychosocial helpline, a free dedicated helpline, which anybody could call 24 hours any day of the week. Uh, and we had counselors trained suddenly within a week all over the country who could manage these calls. Um, we found that women were accessing these numbers much more than men, uh, you know, very, very early on. So what we did was that we made four uh, numbers. So you call the helpline you, and it says, if you're a woman, press something. If you're a child, press another number. If you're an elderly person, press another number. And what we found was that the number of women who were accessing the helpline was the maximum. It was 70% of the helpline was accessed by women. So we clearly knew, um, and, and Eugene has talked about it, how, so it was, it was for help for themselves, but it was also for help for the family, for friends, uh, and the fact that um, they wanted more information about, about mental health, about physical health. Uh, then the stories started pouring in. So I'm just going to read out a few stories. Um, this is 50 year old Sunita. Her husband suspects that she's attracted to other men and abuses her verbally and physically. He retired six months ago and it has just got worse in the last six, three months of during the lockdown. So he never was at home before. He retired and he sees his wife, um, you know, very active, doing lots of things. Um, and he starts suspecting her and she reports severe anxiety because she doesn't know where to go for help. We have a much younger woman, a 19 year old Mina, who has intellectual disability and her mother has met her after 
after two months because she was in the village and she found bruises all over her body. Meena never complained to her mother. Her mother would call her every week, but Meena never complained to her that her husband and her sister-in-law were abusing her. It was only when the lockdown lifted and the borders were open that Meena's mother was able to visit her and saw that she was abused so badly. We have 30-year-old Paul who came to me for help because he said that my wife is having an affair and he wanted me to treat the wife. And he's an electrician. He was working all his life and then with lockdown he stayed at home and he said he could not handle his suspicion because his wife would abruptly stop speaking on the phone when he would enter the room. And the wife said, it's because I'm talking to my sister or my aunt and I don't want to, him to listen to all the women talk. But he, of course, started suspecting that she was having an affair. And he felt that he was at home during the lockdown. So he knows that she's having an affair and maybe it's been going on for a long time. And he said to me, I tried to beat the truth out of her. Finally, 35-year-old Yasmin, an educated woman, a school teacher, she left home because of mental torture. She lives in a joint family with her in-laws and her husband and other people in the family. And she said that they were harassing her, but that her parents would not have either because due to because of the fear of COVID, because they said, you're coming from another family. And she said she was scared to go to a shelter. What if I get infected there? And she's attempted suicide once in the last few months. Now, if you can see the array of stories, these are four different women, different age groups, different socioeconomic status, but their stories are so similar that they were stuck in a situation where they could not have uh, access help. The next slide, please. A lot of people have spoken about it, and I want to use it in the context of mental health. Um, we all know that domestic violence increases when there's financial insecurity. And that is because men become extremely anxious. Uh, they start consuming more alcohol or they do not have money for alcohol. And financial insecurity in so many ways increases mental health problems among men and of course among women and increases domestic violence as well. People have talked about how social isolation can increase violence and lockdown with the abuser and of course relationship conflict due to close proximity and we found that that's that was a big feature because uh, you know when people went to work and they came back home they would have maybe an hour or two with each other and they would somehow manage even if there was a conflict but when they had to stay 24 7 with each other they did not know how to manage conflicts uh, and it escalated violence Societal instability of any kind, be it in disasters, when systems uh, go awry. For example, the police system is not available. Shelters were confused about what needed to be done. Uh, they were not declared essential services for a long time. Uh, and so women were not able to access. Uh, general systems in society, which kind of hold the society together, became completely unstable in this, in this pandemic, especially in the earlier days. Inability to disclose violence, food insecurity and housing instability. So a lot of women were thrown out of houses because they were not able to pay rent. Alcohol, both presence and absence. So we know that alcohol actually is one of the biggest risk factors for gender-based violence and drinking increased during this period. But during lockdown, the people who were uh, used to drinking alcohol did not have alcohol and so became more agitated uh, we saw more cases coming into our uh, emergency services and there was an increase in increase in violence. And finally, fears related to the virus. So if you had women like nurses, doctors, domestic workers who were going out to work and coming back home, their husbands often suspected them of carrying the virus home and there was violence related to fear of the virus itself. And so, for example, if, if the man was a taxi driver, he would have lost his job. He would be drinking at home. His wife would be a domestic worker or a nurse or a hospital aide who needed to work because she needed, she was the only earning member. She would go, go back home and the man would beat her saying, you know, you're probably bringing infection back to my family. So I think these were many, many layers of, uh, of reasons why violence happened. The next slide, please. I would think of COVID pandemic as, as trauma and psychological injury. So whether the woman is going through physical violence, whether she was going through violence in the workplace, whether she was going through violence in the public transport, 
the whole pandemic and the fact that she was not able to access care and shelter very easily, not able to talk about what was happening to her, was, was a trauma and psychological injury. And my sense is that we are, we are already seeing a post-traumatic stress disorder epidemic. We have more and more women coming with trauma-related conditions. And we also know that when women who've gone through past trauma face situations like the COVID pandemic, the, the, it is a trigger for reliving the trauma that they have gone through earlier. And we are seeing a lot of women who are coming to us with trauma-related uh, mental health problems. Uh, there were women who faced violence after the infection. And this was something that uh, was, was really sad to see. Uh, women who, who had pandemic, had the COVID-19 infection would go in for help to hospitals or go in for childbirth and faced even more stigma, violence and isolation uh, because uh, they had the infection. There was a lot of psychological violence and stigma and discrimination towards families where there was somebody who had COVID infection. I want to also highlight that a lot of women and young girls face digital and online violence. And this was because a lot of the communication was happening online. Um, there was Zoom bombing happening. Uh, a lot of um, sexual messages were coming into adolescents who were on their school uh, you know, learning or college learning online. And uh, I don't think we had actually paid enough attention to digital uh, you know, sexual and, and partner violence till date. And finally, I want to emphasize obstetric violence, which is a very important form of gender-based violence, which happens in many countries normally. But if a woman was thought to have infection, or if she was found to have infection, she was shunted from one hospital to another. Obstetricians refused to touch her. She was isolated. She, uh, the baby was removed from her. She was not allowed to breastfeed. A whole range of things happened, which led to obstetric violence. So it was not just... Um, domestic violence, but it was domestic violence plus a range of other forms of violence. The next slide, please. Um, it was also because mental health care settings are not open. We were asked to shut down uh, for nearly two months. We were not available to our patients. It was very sad for us, but the institutions were not there. And so we were trying to do online sessions. Now, nobody taught us how to do online counseling or online therapy for women facing violence. So if, you are, if you're talking to women online and they're at home and the abuser is nearby, there was no, there, it was so hard for us to talk to the woman and get her uh, alone. And we had to develop lots of tricks to be able to do that. There was increased burden on health services, so collateral damage was on mental health. Uh, women were reluctant to visit health facilities. And like I said, prot protocols for online mental health support in GPV were not available. They're still not available. And we are trying to develop them. Uh, and I think that's something that we all should get together and, and see what we can do to have safe uh, mental health services for women facing violence. And the last slide. So I would say that we know that COVID-19 is just one of the pandemics that has come and is gradually going and may come again, but there are going to be many other pandemics and we really need to start getting prepared for this. Um, I, I think that what this has whole exercise has taught me, has taught a lot of our ministries and we are working closely with the police, with the women and child development programs that we need to address, not just, uh, you know, we, we need to know that there are different, women have different kinds of women have different kinds of needs. Uh, it cannot be one size fit all. So we need specific program for adolescents. And this is particularly true, like I know in several African countries, it's happened in India, child marriages have really increased. And a lot of our helpline um, distress calls were related to young women who were being married before the age of 18 because the societal structure had collapsed. Uh, women with disabilities, both physical and intellectual disabilities, need special programs. Marginalized women, like she talked about, strong alcohol-related policies when pandemics happen, paying attention to the mental health of men, because in pandemics, if men are suffering, if they have mental health problems, then violence increases, and developing family-related interventions. We've all talked about strong involvement of women as key stakeholders in planning programs, um, and mental health being a very, very important uh, part of uh, you know, gender-based violence services. So I think these are things that we should start talking about and planning uh, so that we are not caught like how we were caught with COVID-19. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Chandra, uh, to develop the role of stigma, stress, and also to give us a mental health lens to illustrate gender-based violence. Very interesting and too often neglected. So now um, I'm going to, to give the floor to the final panelist, Diana is a great friend, a great expert since more than 30 years. Uh, you don't see that when you look at her, how young she is, but uh, she has impacted women and girls around the world. And I want to welcome you to welcome her with me. Uh, she will share with us the United Nation and African Union recommendation and solution for ending gender-based violence beyond ordinary period. Welcome to you, Diana. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Agnes, my good friend. Uh, thank you for giving me the honor to be on this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, fellow panelists, uh, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. And um, I just, given that I have five minutes, I will pick maybe one or two things that uh, previous panelists have spoken about and then run through very quickly with your permission what the US uh, UN response or recommendations uh, to COVID-19 GBV are. And since our dear panelists of the African Union has already gone through what the A Union, uh, African Union uh, recommends, with your permission, I could let that be uh, so that there's no repetition. Repet uh, repetition. We have heard something very important. Um, the fact that all speakers have pointed to the fact that COVID-19 only worsened pre-existing toxic social norms and gender disparities. I think that is very important. Um, it's important in, uh, in respect to how we are going to move forward in recommending concrete action to address these challenges. We have also heard how it has increased women's workload and especially in the area of unpaid care work. We have also heard about um, the great uh, toll uh, or um, problem it has raised in terms of the economy. Uh, we have seen what it has done to the girl child in terms of the increased pregnancies, increased child marriage, and all the abuses around it. We have also heard about the impact on, our, on uh, women's and girls' mental health. It was therefore important uh, that um, many people came together to try and address uh, collectively what the response can be. And the UN also had, um, through the UN Secretaries General's UN Comprehensive Response to COVID-19 to save lives, protect societies, and recover better. So in this global uh, framework that the UN Secretary General has put together, to which we all adhere, there are responses that have the objective to do four things, to deliver a consolidated, comprehensive global response that leaves no one behind. That is extremely important, especially now that we are talking of gender equality and the empowerment of women, and also the principle of equity. It aims to reduce our vulnerability to future pandemics. So we are learning from COVID-19 uh, the shock that it came, it, it started as a health crisis, but everyone has spoken here and it has touched on different um, uh, sectors. So it has really shaken not only the health infrastructure, but the economic and the social. And thus this lesson learned must not be lost to us. We must learn from it and help us to shape and prepare for future pandemics. The comprehensive response also aims to build resilience to future shocks. And above all climate shocks, um, as you know, uh, climatic uh, 
the climate change also has comes with it climate induced uh, diseases which have to be addressed. And the fourth objective is to overcome the severe and systemic inequalities exposed by the pandemic. We have spoken of gender inequalities, but we have also spoken of regional inequalities, the marginalized that have not been reached. We have spoken of um, mm -hmm. various um, uh, inequalities that exist, economic, the poorer getting even poorer, et cetera. I will very quickly run through the content of the UN response plan, which is basically promote, it basically promotes three pillars of operation. The first, it aims at delivering a large scale, comprehensive, uh, co coordinated health response. It also um, recommends the adoption of policies that address at the same time the socioeconomic ramifications of this uh, pandemic, humanitarian and human rights uh, aspects of the crisis, including prevent and response the increased level of violence against women and girls. And it is actually that point that I am going to now break down uh, in the next slide a recovery process that helps us to build forward better. Next. And so what are the recommendations now um, when we break them down? They, as as uh, I said, they come in three pillars. Let's look at the first one, the dedicated actions and strategies to prevent and address GBV. So um, I think almost all the speakers identified the importance of having a strong policy framework within which to work in order to have responses at the local level. In, in, in essence, what this means is that uh, what we are recommending is to ensure at the first level that the GBV response services, including, for example, the justice services, are designated as essential and remain open and accessible. When we have national and subnational COVID-19 response plans, we have them in the, policy, in the policies that we um, are adopting and that we are revising. But in reality, we go a step lower and look at the different um, services that are required and look at how exactly they are going to be implemented, these policies are going to be implemented. Another example is, for, exa uh, for instance, when we are looking at the allocation of budgets. When we did, uh, when uh, governments had their national plans, most of them decided to review those national plans according to the impact of COVID-19 and reallocated their budgets to maybe health services, for example, some de decided to have uh, uh, eco socioeconomic stimulus packages. Others decided to improve infrastructure and um, um, medical services. Others decided to also invest in um, a digital transfer transformation to be able to have um, e-government uh, moving on. They looked at the education system, the most important is to ensure that this budgeting process also looks at the differential, the gender differential and the impact that this pandemic has had on, uh, um, on gender and gender-based violence. Uh, the second is to provide coordination, support and advice. What we are trying to look at here is to have the experts such as yourself working in tandem, not only with the health sector, but across the board with all sectors, working together in, an, in, an, in a coordinated multi-sectoral approach and providing the requisite coordinated support and advice that is informed by technical expertise. Because the, uh, the, the pandemic, as you have seen, had so many different facets 
And so much damage was done that we just cannot afford uh, to have a process where uh, each sector is working on its own. The third was to adapt and expand services such as shelters, safe spaces, and essential housing, along with psychosocial support and advice for individuals experiencing or at risk of DVD. This has been a very typical approach to the uh, area of, uh, to the response on GBV. However, it is important to note that the overall objective is to actually eliminate and eradicate uh, gender-based violence. The fact that we have shelter homes, we have self safe spaces, we have all these services for gender-based violence must be a way of addressing the immediate challenges the challenges that were enhanced because of COVID-19, but in the long run to actually do away with them because hopefully gender-based violence would have been a thing of the past. And as such, in preparing these shelters, we adapt them in such a way that they are multifaceted and can be used later as probably economic hubs or something else. I have spoken about the support to justice actors, uh, police, for example, this is extremely important and it is actually underlined. But as one speaker said, it cannot be a solo um, pathway. It has to be in tandem with your concept of one-stop centers where you have holistic support uh, on gender-based violence to the various service providers. The next guideline that is given in response uh, in integrating gender-based violence in COVID-19 responses is the importance of assessments and updates of gender-based violence referral pathways to reflect any changes in informal or formal services or access points as a result of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, in terms of coordination as, as always, it is important that we do a lot of assessment, that we monitor trends, but more important that we keep documentation and we keep information and we have a referral system such that I heard someone saying that some, um, there's uh, also this fear of women utilizing these services for fear of getting exposed to the virus, to the pandemic, uh, to the uh, to, to COVID-19. Uh, it is important also that this information uh, that, that we have on, on, on uh, I would want to call them patients, that we have, we have it in such a way that it is, yes, confidential, but it is also readily accessible to any institution that may need it, um, such that uh, the, the services that are provided uh, run smoothly. But from our experience in terms of uh, severe cases of GBV uh, and severe cases also of people who have been exposed uh, to COVID-19, one of the issues that we found uh, in terms of, of, of providing support was the delay in providing this support because of the information that was not available. Next is the engagement uh, engage government, private sector, and civil society actors, including community, traditional, and faith-based leaders to, strong, to send a strong message that violence will not be tolerated. It has, um, we have seen the important role that civil society actors, but especially traditional and faith-based leaders play, not only during the pandemic, but in society as a whole, and much more in the African context. It is amazing uh, the impact that traditional and faith-based leaders have uh, on gender equality and the empowerment of women. They have a very strong voice in society. And for a long time, they had not been um, actively engaged in uh, all, uh, all uh, interventions for gender equality and empowerment of women. 
But in the COVID-19 um, dispensation, what has really proved uh, to be a game changer uh, based on some of the feedback that we have received from different countries, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Peru, et cetera, is just the intervention of civil society actors, but especially the traditional and faith-based leaders. They have been very strong when given support in sending the right messages that should be sent. In Niger, for example, just last week, the Association of Traditional Leaders of Niger uh, informed the, a high-level panel that was uh, visiting that due to the advocacy and information that they have received on child marriage and its negative impact, their intervention over the past year has reduced uh, child marriage over the past three years has reduced child marriage by 10%, and they were willing to continue this advocacy. Uh, they are very, very well listened to. So it is important in all our interventions to include especially those influencers and uh, leaders that are not necessarily that typical when we come to developing programs provide direct and indirect support to civil society, that is obvious. They reach the unreached. And if we are speaking of leaving no one behind, we have to reach those community-based organizations and civil society organizations that go to places that we cannot. Mitigating the economic impact of COVID-19, extremely important. I, needn't, uh, uh, I don't need to uh, overemphasize the point uh, of the big, big link that uh, financial security has with gender-based uh, violence. And it is important to um, have strategies uh, to address this uh, economic impact. Thank you for changing the slide. The second is the strategies and actions to mainstream gender-based violence prevention and response in non-GBV interventions. Addressing the GBV risk factors in socioeconomic assessments. Most countries, if not all, came up and actually uploaded their national socioeconomic assessments and responses to COVID. Naturally, the big pillars were health, uh, socioeconomic uh, um, pillars, and very, very few looked at the issues of uh, equality and equity. It is important to also insist beyond gender equality and the empowerment of women to have a specific look in the socioeconomic assessments, even if they have to be revised uh, going forward, the GBV risk factors. It has a very big impact on the economy itself, first, of, uh, first and foremost on the person, but also on the economy. And if we are going to speak about uh, ensuring that we are in our budgets, uh, maximizing um, uh, the uh, financing for development, we have to ensure that we are not using that uh, financing for preventable, preventable um, uh, matters. Uh, do no harm, uh, of course, in our interventions, we have to ensure that we are protecting the people that we are, what we are supposed to be protecting. We are protecting their identities. We are also protecting uh, their dignity. Integrating GBV prevention into COVID-19 is the same thing uh, in terms of making sure that the policies speak to GBV, but also in our, is our, in our interventions of us, as I have said before, that our interventions are targeted, they are multi-sectoral, they are coordinated, and they are financed. Very quickly, I will run through the other considerations. Uh, and this will be my, uh, I think the last slide, because as I've said, my colleague from African Union did a very good job in um, uh, speaking to the responses and the recommendations from the African Union. When you look at the SDGs, 
one of the important things that we will see is the link that gender equality and the empowerment of women, SDG 5, has on and the impact it has on all the other 17 um, uh, goals. Putting women and girls at the response, at the center of the response, and indeed at the center of economic development is a no brainer. Uh, I think, uh, Professor Agnes, you, you said it very well in your opening remarks, and so did the others, that it is the game changer. Uh, we have also seen uh, what impact uh, women leadership has had on the response as a whole. And uh, not including women and girls and putting them first and foremost at the center of the response is actually shooting ourselves in the leg. We need to utilize data. Uh, somebody said, I mean, on what basis will we be having our response if we don't have data, uh, credible data, and data that is regularly updated? Um, we haven't spoken of this much, but it is important, just as with the private sector, the traditional leaders, uh, faith-based institutions and civil society, we need to engage men and boys. I, I, I really appreciated the, the speaker on uh, mental health, and also speaking to the men and seeing what are their fears, what are their aspirations, what is stressing them and what is the driver, what is fueling this uh, uh, gender-based violence and using that as a, a response as well. Just as we are responding to supporting women, having shelters, looking at policies, uh, making sure that they are financing, we also have to look at the question of why men do what they do, some men and boys actually per, uh, perpetrate a violence and, look, and try to address uh, um, their, their fears in this, this, this response. COVID-19, if there's one thing that it taught us, it taught us the fact that technology um, is indispensable. When it first came as <laughs> for IR, I know countries like Rwanda have moved very fast in using uh, artificial intelligence, kudos and chapeau uh, um, and other countries. I mean, it, who could have imagined that today we would be sitting and having a meeting uh, virtually like we are doing and very effectively, we would have flown across continents, met face to face, which was actually very good but business continues and technology henceforth is indispensable. Um, this next two, of course, adopt an intersectional approach. I've spoken about that. And one of the things that we'll have to be very bold about and have no excuses about in our institutions, in our homes, in government, we need to enforce the zero tolerance for any form of sexual abuse and harassment and gender-based violence, whether inside or outside COVID. Thank you so much for your patience. And once again, thank you for the invitation. Dear Diana, thank you very much for actionable recommendation we should all implement. And thank you all the panelists for insightful presentation. I know that the audience has many questions. I have already a list here, but I want to remind everybody and everyone that all your questions sent during the, the, the webinar uh, by Zoom, Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook will all be answered using the platform Ask Professor Agnes uh, platform um, using Zoom, uh, using Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I have, I'm going to ask a question to all of you. And my first question go to you, Jean. Uh, as discussed uh, in your presentation, 70% of health workers are women, which means that they are disproportionately affected during the pandemic, as you have very well demonstrated. Could you briefly discuss how government can build sustainable infrastructure or what they can do to protect female health workers against gender-based violence during this pandemic, inside work, outside work. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. Uh, and I think the you need a foundation to build off of. You know, you, 
it, you can't just focus directly on the, the health worker. So I think uh, our colleague Diana explained perfectly the foundation through which uh, when you could focus on each of the sections. And then once you have the foundation laid out, the health workers have their own uh, special needs. Um, and the, the most important one is ensuring safe working conditions. And so, you know, there, there is a concern that because this is a man's world, PPE has been built uh, and has been constructed with, with men in mind. And so we have to focus on tailoring protective equipment to uh, different bodies and to different, uh, to different shapes, to different sizes, when usually the, the, the neutral fit is often uh, a man. Uh, we have to focus on fair compensation because in almost every country, women are paid less, especially in the, in the health realm. And, and that affects morale, but it also affects the ability of, of women to access other services like childcare, uh, you know, when they're first forced to work longer hours. Other colleagues have discussed um, improved, increased access to mental health services. Uh, we found was important uh, at our hospital in Boston, but also uh, uh, increased childcare services and emergency backup services. Um, paid sick leave, so uh, prioritizing uh, increased paid sick leave. And then um, things that are women specific like support for uh, menstrual hygiene. So I read in China that women were often able, they couldn't take off work at all for an entire 24 hour shift to attend to menstrual hygiene. So some started taking uh, birth control pills to try and even eliminate their cycles. So, um, you know, there needs to be a focus on, um, you know, not only the physiological needs, but, um, you know, things like, uh, you know, uh, you know, being able to pump milk and having rooms for that. You know, the, we talk a lot about gender norms uh, being, important to focus on, but the built environment is also very important to focus on. So it's not just the, the rooms and the architecture, but it's the PPE that we build. So I get, again, I think it comes to what, what I said in my last slide and, and you've discussed that, you know, um, most, most institutions I see recommending ensuring women are consulted on management teams. I think they should be leading the management teams, because as we as we've shown, whether it's heading countries or whether it's wearing masks, women are consistently doing a better job. And so um, the evidence based approach would be to put them in charge of containment. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, yes, it's a comprehensive uh, approach. And uh, as is as it, a it is a structural problem, it has to have a structural solution. The next question is for you, Shadra. Uh, from listening to your presentation and uh, to other panelists also, this is the question that came out. Uh, from your experience as a psychiatrist, what are the challenges to provide mental health support during COVID time? And what can we do as individuals and as community to support gender-based violence survivors and victims, especially during this time as we are dealing with the global pandemic. Thank you, Professor Agnes. Uh, that's a very important question. Um, firstly, I think that you know most countries, at least the low and middle income countries, don't have enough mental health professionals. So uh, we can't depend on highly qualified psychiatrists to be able to offer those kind of services. I think there is a very strong need to improve and enhance the community health system and train people in simple, basic mental health interventions, um, which, which can be done. And there have been many experiments around the world which have done that. But I think that to, in, to integrate the whole area of gender-based violence in any mental health training, that we are doing. Because what I find is that even my trainees, my residents, uh, they're all very apprehensive about uh, handling gender-based violence. Uh, we know that uh, nearly 40% of women who 
access mental health services report some form of gender based violence but even trained professionals do not know how to handle gender based violence and they would invariably refer the woman to me and say you know you know what to do please do it so i think and there's a lot of apprehension about opening the pandora's box and we don't know what to do how do we support this woman uh, so i think developing models of mental health interventions uh, for women who face gender based violence and training community health workers in that is i think one of the key things uh, like i said before there is not enough in terms of technology or online methods yet uh, and it's something that i think you know i was listening to diana speaking and i realized that that's something that we really need to develop uh, we developed uh, using artificial intelligence with a young colleague we developed a chatbot called shakti aunty now um, shakti basically means powerful and as aunty so if it's on your whatsapp uh, your husband or your partner would not suspect that it's a chatbot which is going to help you manage violence and it was like an aunty but the aunty was actually advising uh, through artificial intelligence uh, the woman about what she can do what her options were so i think things like this which are very simple which are not very expensive need which can help in mental health need to be evolved need to be developed uh, and i would put my money on these two aspects using technology to improve mental health services and training community health workers to provide basic care uh, and uh, you know to to women who face gender based violence and like somebody else mentioned about managing men's mental health i think it's something that we've ignored for a long time uh, and it's it's an area that we need to focus on thank you Uh, thank you, Sandra. There is a question here for you, uh, Jane Flora. The African Union has done a tremendous job in developing un unified continent-wide measures and strategies to mitigate the effect of COVID-19. Do you see similar effort being invested in the fight against gender-based violence on the continent as well? How can we implement lessons learned from fighting against epidemic? in the fight against gender based violence to you flora okay thank you so much uh, professor agnes uh, uh, for a very good question um, i think what uh, the african union uh, commission is doing that uh, it, we are trying to do um, the advocacy uh, for the time being we are doing the advocacy activity online advocacy activity for the fighting of gender based violence also we normally uh, organize regular meetings with the ministers uh, in, charge, in charge of gender um, and women affairs uh, of the african union as well as um, other uh, stakeholders like uh, we did organize a meeting uh, during this period of uh, pandemic uh, we did organize a meeting with the minister three ministers of uh, uh, three meetings with the minister of gender and women affairs we did organize uh, another meeting with the uh, female uh, au ministers of foreign affairs and uh, we did organize also a meeting with uh, african women leaders um, and the civil society organization as well because we wanted to draw attention to um to them uh, on issue of gender based violence so during this meeting uh, we did uh, have some kind of recommendation and also member state eu member states uh, uh, they had the opportunity to learn i mean uh, one another because uh, some countries they have best practice and uh, i can say also uh, the outcome of this uh, kind of meeting uh we had the opportunity to present the outcome of the meeting to executive council of the african union in october 2020 where the um the there was a decision on the covid-19 saying that we should be able at the african union gender i mean at, um, african union as a whole to be able to develop and implement au guideline on gender responsive as a framework to integrate gender equality and women empowerment in decision making process in africa covid-19 response and post covid-19 recovery plan so you can see that the african union is doing so many things 
and also we have we yeah we are doing I, I can say that we are doing so many studies on gen COVID nineteen and gender issue. So we had we we are about to finish a study on uh, gen on COVID nineteen and gender based violence. Maybe we'll be able to share to share with you the copy of the studies. And also Great. we had uh, um, developed. Uh, the continental COVID-19 gender mainstreaming and women inclusion strategy and roadmap. And uh, we had also been able to develop the impact assessment of COVID-19 on gender equality and women empowerment. And now we are finalizing um, uh, a study on data on gender uh, gender-based violence. I think we will we, we be able to share with everybody so that you can see how the member states are doing with the issue of, of gender-based violence. Uh, I mean, but uh, in generally the issue of gender equality and women empowerment during the COVID-19 period. And I think also uh, we will be able to also to see through the studies how member states um, I mean, they are doing as the best practice from, I mean, different member states and how may, as you can see, for example, some member states, they have, uh, let's say, uh, women uh, at the high level uh, in terms of managing, let's say, the problem related to COVID-19 so that they can even decide how uh, the issue of gender-based uh, violence can be uh, 100. So the African Union is doing so many things and uh, we will be able to share with you all this kind of uh, information maybe through online and uh, then after we may also <laughs> invite, I mean, uh, you during our next uh, meeting so that you can hear from uh, different member states what uh, the uh, AU member states are doing on issue of uh, COVID-19 and the uh, gender-based virus uh, problem. Thank you. Fantastic. My next question, I will direct that to Ilian. Uh, feminist demonstrators in Lima, Peru, have uh, said this, El Machimo as pandemia, which I translate to machism is a pandemic. What is the role of the Peruvian culture uh, in keeping victims from adhering to violence preventive measure, seeking help and denouncing the behavior, especially during the pandemic? Ilian, to you. Thank you, Agnes, for the interesting question. Well, uh, it's true, machismo is, uh, machism is a pandemic. And also we have another phrase, which is uh, the, the patriarchalism is a race beast. So we have many phrases, you see. But thinking that next year, we're going to celebrate our 200 years as a republic. And during our whole history, we will build our culture uh, and the guide of the patriarchalist is it's hard to think that uh, only 50 years of the presence of the woman uh, defying the authority of the man or of the baptism is going to work you know in favor of erase our whole history our whole background so <clears throat> Machismo is always on our way. Women in our country vote uh, in elections for the first time in 1955. So you can imagine that machismo is until today an obstacle for our empower empowerment. But new generations are completely different. Right now, it's not social accepted to make sexist joys, jokes uh, or diminish women in public. Uh, sexual harassment in public is also forbidden. For example, you can be fired if some women complain about sexual harassment. So machismo is present, but there is a contrary force very important in the new generations uh, from feminism 
and public in general that don't tolerate violence against women. So our culture is changing for yeah. less at last. We have a big demand of help uh, from women, girls, and teenagers during the crisis. So I think that the COVID uh, turned down that uh, wall. They think they don't have another choice or they think they are not going to get help. Uh, we have a lot of calls that not only pro come from the victims or their parents or their friends, they also come from neighborhoods. They come from people that come across and see the violence in the streets. So I think we have a good opportunity uh, in the middle of this crisis to get in touch with those women that don't know they have another choice instead of, uh, of stay at home with this abu abusive um, couple they have. Um, that's the reason in our emergency center for women, we have a high demand of help from mostly girls and teenagers during the health crisis. And also, uh, uh, we have to strain our forces and um, ask for more help, not only for women or collectives of women. We start to ask um, to strain our forces and our teams with men, men that are truly convinced that we can uh, continue in this uh, violence spiral to whatever is going to take us. No, I think we put a break, we put a stop to the violence at least in our culture. And now on, we have to go all the way to get to, uh, to achieve um, a good result, no? So yeah. one of the most, uh, of the things that uh, give us more recognition in this uh, time of COVID-19 was the measure for protection, the action for protection that are given by a judge in um, using uh, a WhatsApp, using a hearing by by Zoom, we are making a, a, our all judiciary system has adapted to the COVID nineteen to protect women, and that I think is a good result of this situation. And also, um, one of the reasons because uh, women stay at home is that they think they don't have enough money to support their family. So they sacrifice themselves for their family. And then come the state and say, you don't have to do that. We can provide you for this time. You, you can, if you want to, we can take out the aggressor from your home or we can give you an emergency patient. So this judge by hearing, by, you know, by Zoom or by Google Meet or by Hangout or by cameras, uh, it's allowed to give you this emergency pension and apply the aggressor to give it to you. Uh, Fantastic. So this is a shift on culture due to a non-precedent pandemic. I think <laughs> you have um, a ton of uh, disaster in opportunity. My next question go to Che. Shay, in two, two minutes, uh, just tell me why it is important to invest in research to address gender-based violence in women of indigenous or minority group. Thank you for the question. Um, it's important to invest because we know that indigenous women and other women from historically marginalized groups experience violence, not just because they're women, but because they are indigenous or from another minority group. And we know that people with multiple identities experience discrimination and prejudice, which intersects to make them further vulnerable to experiencing violence. So for Indigenous women, it's not simply their gender, which causes their oppression, um, but their status as colonised Indigenous persons. Um, class also plays a part there. Indigenous women who live in poverty face additional obstacles and challenges um, in life um, and when they experience violence to pursuing health um, and justice. Um, and it's also important to say that these are not homogenous groups. There's a wealth of diversity and different experience and knowledge and contextual realities like within, within Indigenous people and within other minority groups. But acknowledging all of that is, is not only research which must take an intersectional approach, but the interventions um, to address gender-based violence. 
uh, that these women experience. And those interventions must be shaped and led by the women whom it affects. Um, they can't just be considered passive beneficiaries, but leaders in that space. And they must be at the center with us listening to them and hearing their voices, their priorities and their agendas. Thank you, Che. Very interesting. A lot of uh, avenue for progress uh, and uh, create a better world through research. Uh, Rose, there is a question here that uh, took, uh, I want to ask you, uh, the, with the measure of confinement, could you briefly tell us how it was in Rwanda, especially concerning children? Uh, thank you, uh, Agnes. Um, uh, it is true that the global data show an increase of uh, GBV incidents worldwide uh, due to combined factors. Uh, uh, in Rwanda, there was also, uh, although there was no uh, comprehensive uh, uh, survey, uh, but we anticipate that there has been some increase, especially uh, in regards to, uh, to um, physical violence. Uh, especially due to economic uh, issues and the, and the challenges. Uh, and uh, district hospitals records show that they have received uh, increased cases during uh, this time. Uh, regarding the child defilement, it has been increasing over the last four years before COVID-19 lockdown. But however, during the period March to July, 2020, a rapid comprehensive analysis conducted using RIB, the Investigation Bureau data on the impact of COVID-19 and lockdown showed that there is no significant impact on the increase of child defilement cases as a result of COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, this has been uh, attributed uh, mostly to the close and the continued presence of parents at home and the limited movement of children. Uh, there is, however, a need to continue exploring more data uh, and uh, ensure that appropriate prevention and response measures um, are advised. Uh, here, the point uh, I'd like to make is uh, that children protection, it has been shown in this lockdown time, can uh, uh, really decrease defilement. And uh, uh, in uh, Rwanda, we have, um, uh, during, before just uh, lockdown and years before, uh, there has been an increase of daycare facilities. And we are anticipating that the fact that this uh, care, the daycare services, when they resume, there will be, um, we believe, uh, more protection for children. What when we can anticipate a, a, a kind of uh, um, of reduction. We have also uh, in uh, the the investigation uh, prospects uh, improved much on forensic services. And this also is going to support very much the justice sector and bring more conviction when there is uh, those kind of incidences, what was very difficult before. So the other thing that we have seen during this COVID time is really the use of ICT that has, that has been very influential in reporting and also conveying information to uh, victims or their families of where they can report, subs they can get. And we think that this um, ICT is going to be one of the very, very important tools that is going to be improved in the country. Fantastic. So we have two great things coming out uh, this, this, the, this disaster of COVID. 19. In Peru, a shift of culture, machism is rolling back. And in Rwanda, even if GBV, gender-based violence has probably increased, the firemen of children because of 
probably parents of the mother be at home all time as they craze. So uh, lesson to take for future actions. Uh, Diana, I want to move for you. There is a question here for you. The United Nations uh, uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development includes 17 sustainable development goals uh, to be reached. What role does goal five, gender equality, equality, play in contributing to the attainment of SDG overall and how is violence against women uh, captured in that? In two minutes, Diana, this is a challenge because it's a lot. A huge question, but I will try and do it in a minute and a half or two. <laughs> I think there are, three, <laughs> there are three important things that I would say. Yeah? I think the first that we've all said it is the fact that gender equality and the empowerment of women is the glue that binds us uh, in terms of all the whole development agenda. How, what do I mean by this? I will give a very simple example of agriculture. Uh, gender equality and the empowerment of women is SDG five, it's goal five. There are 17 goals. If you concentrate on that goal five and decide uh, to invest in women in agriculture because they are the majority in that field, because they, subs they um, constitute the poorest of the poor in many communities as we have heard, and because by using them, agriculture is the backbone of most economies, you will find that at the end, and especially if you invest in modern agriculture, that you are likely that these women are likely to have an impact on goal number one, which is ending poverty, on goal number two, which is ending hunger, on goal number three, which of course, because of better nutrition will lead to better health. On goal number four, if from their produce, they can actually have more to sell and to have better, uh, better financial status, they will be able to send their children to school. They will also have an impact if we move agriculture to the next level on the value chains to also have an impact on economic growth, industry and innovation, and so on and, for, and so forth. They will have an impact on uh, SDG 10, which is reducing inequality, SDG 12, responsible consumption. If the agricultural practices are well done, they will also have a positive impact on the effects of climate change. We'll have less soil erosion, et cetera and life on land and also on partnerships. It is very, very important. I mean, it's not just a slogan, leave no one behind. Number one, they play a very important uh, role in the economy. Now we have been told that gender-based violence occurs mainly in households, not, not exclusively, but mainly in households where poverty is deepened. So the impact thereof uh, of investing in SDG 5 is that you will have not only an impact on 11 of the 17 goals, but then it becomes a deterrent to violence against women because the setup will be better. Better Absolutely. finances, better economy, better health, better education, etc. So I hope I did it in two minutes. Oh, you explained that so well and through an angle that is quite uh, innovative, agriculture. Very well done and very ex um, uh, didactic. Uh, Jean, in 30 seconds, because it's not a woman issue, gender-based violence, it's not only a men issue, but you are the only men on the panel. How can we engage men and boys as an ally uh, in the fight against gender-based violence, something that has not been said in the panel. Well, first, uh, the model of UGHE as a university for equity, I think is very important. Uh, you know, there's not many other, or, or there might not be any other universities in the world with that dedication, but it also needs to start at the elementary levels. 
And so there are places uh, like Prerna in India that have um, gender equity, equity built into the curriculum to teach young men um, feminist informed approaches um, that basically give alternative visions of, of masculinity or machismo. So not only do we need to reduce the machismo, but give alternative visions of it. Um, and then cultivate the critical thinking that, um, you know, so people can understand what equality actually means. And so I think uh, as we've seen, and this is, I guess what I'll end with, uh, you know, the, so the power of social media, it, it has the power to uh, spread Trump's conspiracy theories, but it also has the power to spread uh, justice visions just as powerfully. So, you know, things like your Ask Dr. Agnes, these are all important ways of use, utilizing model, modern tools of communication to disseminate uh, visions of equity. It used to be what, in 1789, we had parchment that all men are created equal, and that wasn't the truth. But I think the new forms of communication will allow these ideas to, to seed and take hold better. Thank you, Jane. So, dear panelists, I thank you so much, dear speakers and the audience, to have stayed one hour more is just to say that we are in need of such a discussion and that we didn't finish it because I have here almost uh, 30 questions that uh, uh, we will answer uh, together on the platform has Professor Agnes. I want to thank you, Rose, Ilian, uh, Jean, Flo Jean Flora, Jean, Che, and Chandra, I and Diana. I want to thank you for taking the time to go one hour over the agenda and for the, the participants to stay uh, with us. So thank you to the Center of Gender Equity for your continued contribution in generating new and important knowledge for working towards uh, gender parity and gender equity. We had brilliant uh, discussion, presentation, and questions, and it's not finished because uh, many of them will be answered through another platform. So I also want to remind that all of you who want to be in touch with the Center of Gender Equity uh, can visit our website, the University of Global Health Equity, and it will direct you to contact uh, Tsiyon uh, uh, directly. So again, it was so good, so in interesting, and an unfinished discussion. Uh, thank you from the US, from Niger, from India, from Peru, uh, from uh, uh, Australia, from Rwanda, uh, from uh, Addis Ababa, uh, et cetera. And I'm sure I am missing something. Ladies and gentlemen, you are great feminists and great and people who are making help the world to make great progress. It was an honor to chair this panel. Bye.